All right, um, it's nice to be here, guys. I'm glad you made it. Uh, it's pretty cool um, to be in front of all of you and talking about web machine. Um, actually, if it wasn't for this project, uh, I probably wouldn't be standing here in front of you because um, web machine uh, is about four years old now, uh, and it's a product of Basha. It's fairly mature. Um, how many people have heard of web machine but haven't used it? Okay, and how many of you have never heard of web machine? Okay, cool. So there's, this, this will be a good talk for you guys. <laughs> um, for those of you who have heard it, you've probably seen a lot of this before, but um, uh, hopefully it inspires you to go home and write something with it. Um, Web Machine was definitely my intro to Erlang. And it's um, really what helped me get started and made the adjustment from uh, other languages to Erlang so much easier for me. Uh, it's just a good place to put your toes in the water. So, my name is Matt Heitzenroder. I work for a company called Basho. Um, probably most of you know Basho as the creator of Reoc. Uh, Reoc is an open source database, um, but we also make a lot of other applications as well um, that are open source. So you've probably maybe heard of Rebar, um, Logger, uh, Reoc Core, um, and of course Web Machine, um, which for me started it all. Um, <clears throat> One of the things uh, that I need to do here is, uh, is just give a shout out to Justin Shady, who's the CTO of um, Asha. This is basically his slide deck, and we're just here rehashing it. Um, and the reason is that uh, one, of our, one of my colleagues couldn't be here today. He was going to be talking about NIFS, so I just jumped in last moment and uh, decided to talk about something that was near and dear to me, which is Web Machine. So Web Machine, um, just to give you an idea, is a practical, executable model for HTTP. Uh, so it helps you build HTTP applications. And frankly, when you take a look at this slide, it's a fairly vague application. So let me just add a little bit of color. Um, it's a toolkit for easily creating well-behaved HTTP applications. So I just made some claims. and. Uh, what exactly do I mean when I say easily create? Um, I mean, this is Erlang. A lot of people have the perception that Erlang is difficult. I, I couldn't uh, disagree with them more, but it is different. It's definitely a transition from what they're used to. Like I said earlier, for me, coming to <laughs> Erlang initially um, from the PHP, Python, Ruby world as a web developer, it was definitely intimidating. Um, when I got started with Web Machine, it made learning Erlang really easy. It actually, all of the functions that I had to write by defining resources, um, basically, uh, I could write things in a very simple and sequential order, and it was very familiar to me. I didn't necessarily have to get my head wrapped around the actor model right away, or um, uh, even you know understand or learn OTP, um, which are both completely awesome things, but I didn't need to learn it first, which was which is what I really needed. I just needed the uh, Erlang light, if you will. So um, it, Web Machine gave me a really low barrier to create an app, uh, create an, uh, an app very quickly, and that was pretty rewarding. And that's what I needed to to get excited about Erlang. Um, so it's, like I said, it's really easy to create things. But what do I mean by well-behaved? And uh, so um, most frameworks that we deal with when we write applications give us um, absolutely no choice around HTTP. It's, if you look at Django or Rails or something like that, um, we don't really have a chance to change the semantics or how things work. It's all the decisions around HTTP are made for us uh, and really doesn't give us the flexibility to, to use it in maybe a, a, a restful semantic style. So um, you're usually left with another decision, which is just go bare bones <coughs> and just go right down to the low level, open up a socket on port 80, and voila, you can start handling all this HTTP yourself and you can do things, but that's not a good choice either because you're either faced with this choice of having a really inflexible framework or you have too much rope to hang yourself. And if you have too much rope to hang yourself, you will realize very quickly that uh, HTTP is very complicated. And there's nothing on this slide that you need to grok right now. It's just an example of the exact decision tree of the HTTP specification um, and, and exactly what its makeup is. 
uh, and, and what a uh, web machine is um, trying to accomplish with it. So, uh, web machine itself is actually trying to expose the decision tree that the HTTP spec had, or specification has been set forth with, and, and it's done that in an executable model. Um, and what's really nice about uh, web machine is it allows us to use predefined function callbacks um, that we can implement inc uh, incrementally uh, as we begin to develop our application. If we don't use the functions, it's not a problem. We make sane choices and we get exactly the results that we would expect. And most of the time what we're looking for is a 200 OK. And that's good. And so if you're a new developer to Erlang like me, um, or at least four years ago, uh, you just want to be able to write the Hello World app and, and see some success very quickly. And it could not be easier with Web Machine. So um, here's an example of exactly what it takes to write your first Web Machine resource. It's about four lines of boilerplate code. Uh, you see the first four, it's just declaring the module, you know, exporting which functions that are allowed to be called, um, including the library for Web Machine, uh, starting it up, and uh, giving the uh, output of it. That's all it takes. Really, the first four lines are just boilerplate. The last two lines here um, is just uh, what it takes to give you a 200 OK with a body that says hello world. So, uh, I mean, pretty incredible to write four lines of code and not have to re-implement the entire HTTP spec. So, this is a good thing. But, of course, it's not very interesting, as is any hello world. So, we probably want to do something a little bit more interesting. Um, and be able to utilize a lot more of the HTTP specification. And so, um, if you're going to do that, you either have the choice of going and coding it yourself or using Web Machine. And if you do use Web Machine, it's pretty easy. I might want to do something like a, uh, a conditional request. Um, and in that case, all I need to do is generate an entity tag, make sure that's uh, some kind of unique identifier for my resource when I return a response and also give a last modified date. So um, Web Machine makes it very simple to just make these resource callbacks, generate e tag, uh, and last modified, it will automatically add the headers to the response body. Um, and you can just see that, you know, right there, it's probably not the cleanest way to do it, but we're just handing back the state um, or some hex value of the state so that we can uh, hash it. In, a, in one way, and then we're also just adding back the, the, the last, uh, last modified of the, of the file. So really easy to just do these two callbacks and add two new headers to your, to your thing and actually have conditional requests um, and get back the 304 if that's the case. So um, you, know, you can now see that there's just a few different callbacks that you want to make. In fact, there's probably a few dozen, and I didn't include all of them because I don't want to overwhelm you. But um, you know, here's just a few. You can see that I can handle 401s with uh, is authorized, or I can check whether or not a resource exists. If I don't want to return a 404, I can always return true. I can just decide whether or not a resource exists or not. Uh, maybe if I'm checking to see if uh, a resource or a value um, is, is there and I don't want it, and it's decided by some call that I make to my storage. Um, the resource exists could actually arbitrarily return a true or false Boolean value um, to be able to tell us whether or not I should send back 404 or not um, along the decision tree. Really nice for writing uh, RESTful applications. So the more of these that you write, the more of these callbacks, these function callbacks in a particular web machine resource module, you can take greater advantage of the HTTP spec um, as it is. But again, you can do it as minimally as possible and just build on it incrementally as a developer so you can continually add new features. So you have a pretty good idea now of what it actually takes in terms of callbacks, but um, when you're actually looking at the callback itself, uh, it's um, really uh, just very straightforward. They have a very consistent uh, uh, function signature. So you can see that in any function, we pass in two parameters or two arguments, um, the, the request data and the state. And that always returns us a three-part tuple. And that three-part tuple is going to be the return value, um, the request data, and the state. So what happens here is that when we pass this function through, or when we call this function, we hand our request data in, and we get 
a value back um, as the first part of this tuple uh, that would be the request data. And we could have modif we could have modified that. We couldn't necessarily mutate the state, but we can return a new data structure. Um, and what this does by having this functional uh, this fun uh, function signature, this consistent function signature of passing these values through um, the request data and the state, you're actually able to then um, uh, pass these through and, and uh, thread them through your request cycle. Uh, and it's really nice because it's basically transparent at all steps and all stages through uh, the decision tree as you're, as you're progressing through it. Um, one last point that I want to make is that the, uh, the state is a completely arbitrary data structure and that web machine doesn't inspect it, doesn't access it, doesn't do anything with it, but it allows you to basically maintain uh, an Erlang structure or some kind of data structure, uh, like a, uh, an Erlang record or something if you want. Um, and so for the, cycle, or for the life of the, the request cycle, you can actually then maintain state between function calls and, and be able to access that and mutate it if you want, um, of course, in an immutable way. Uh, so it's really nice to be able to do this. Um, it makes it easy to read and it makes it easy to write. Um, so once you actually get into writing a function um, of one of these callbacks, um, one of the things you want to do often is probably just you know, be able to access the request data that's coming through. And so we provide, uh, as part of Web Machine, uh, or there's, uh, Web Machine provides a module called WRQ. Um, and this is the part where it allows you to actually access the data structure, um, but you can't necessarily mutate it. It will return a new value, so it's um, non-destructible. So uh, it won't ever give you those kind of side effects. Um, very much in the best practice vein of, of early. Um, so it's just good functional hygiene. Um, and I think this is yet another good example of what introduced me to early and some of its best practices. Um, let's see here. Uh, you know, at the end of, I'm um, sorry, uh, the WRQ module, module, we can access the uh, request header, but we can also um, set a response header. And I, even though I said that uh, you can't necessarily mutate the data structure, it will actually return a value that you can then pass through uh, as part of the next chain of calls. So it doesn't, doesn't necessarily mutate it, but it does give you back a new mutated data structure that you can then pass through. Um, so. Uh, one of the other things, as I was pointing out earlier about uh, the state, just passing that through, the state is only lived through a request cycle. Um, and this is actually pretty important because fundamentally HTTP is a stateless protocol, so it should not be a long-lived global state process. Erlang, uh, or Web Machine rather, gives you the ability to do that, but it doesn't necessarily um, and you, and you can do that if you want to have some kind of global state long running process if you want. But Web Machine would never give you the access directly to be able to do that. You would have to spin off another process or whatever and, and then just be able to access it that way. Um, so. uh, the last thing, one of the, or one of the things that you need uh, really to build an application is to be able to do your URL dispatching. Um, you'll obviously need to be able to uh, access the resources that you write and to be able to make sure that requests are going to the right places at the right time. And uh, it's a, another good intro to Erlang in my mind. Uh, it's pattern matching. And so what we have is this URL dispatching list, which is a list of tuples. And it's a three-part tuple um, where the first is a, a, uh, a list term and then the atom of the resource that we want to access, the actual module. And then some arbitrary um, arguments that we may want to pass through uh, at the initiation of the request. So we looked, you know, you look back at the boilerplate code for the hello world, you saw the, in the initialize function. When we do that initialize function, we can actually pass in uh, values based on our dispatching um, to, to, the, uh, to the request uh, state at, at the beginning. So um, let's see here. We've defined a rule here where we uh, created resource A. And so if I just go to my browser and say, okay, my host slash A, 
uh, to that resource, it will take me to some resource in that some resource module. Um, any other URL right now, I'll get a 404, which is a pretty sane default. Um, with URL dispatching, uh, we might want to do something a little bit more than just a slash A, um, but we, we definitely want to be able to access it. And uh, in order to do that, um, the, the WRQ module comes in pretty handy here as well. Uh, we can actually access the request data, get the path information. You can see an example here uh, for the request of just slash A coming in, we just do a WRQ path and that returns a, a uh, list of slash A. Um, and we can go for there. But if we want to do something a little bit more interesting, we can build a two-term um, a two-term uh, list in this in this beginning part of the tuple. And by using the atom uh, of an asterisk, we can actually treat that as a wild card. So anything after slash a will match. And you can see here that uh, a, b, c. Um, we can then access uh, this through the request data using the WRQ module. Um, and you can see the different things uh, or the different parts about it. So if this was ABCD, we'd get ABCD as well. Um, and it becomes really convenient if you use path tokens because it tokenizes the different parts of the URL uh, for you. Um, let's see here. Another nice feature about the URL dispatching is that you can actually bind a variable. Um, and Ironically, you can use an atom as a variable. <coughs> so uh, in this case, we do an, another two-part um, list. And foo, uh, in this case, becomes more or less a variable. And so if I do a request to my resource here and foo, uh, abc, that won't work because it terminates at you know, ab. Uh, it would look a little bit more like this. So in this case, I do a request to ab. And Foo, as you can see here, if I use path info, will actually allow me to access uh, the the value of that 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 path. So I basically define this variable um, as foo, and uh, and I can just access it through path info. This is really useful if you're doing something like a username. Um, so if you're trying to build a RESTful API, or you just want to be able to determine what path are they hitting. You can just use the WRQ path info. You define an atom in the in the first part of the tuple list, um, and uh, or the first list in the tuple, and you just um, can build it from there. And uh, you're not necessarily bound um, uh, by this. You can um, continue to grow this list as much as you want to be able to define the path uh, in this first part of the tuple. So you have uh, your, your resource, you have your variable, and then you can have another wildcard. And you can continue to see how this behaves um, as you go through it here, uh, looking at the WRQ module. So um, the last thing is you couldn't get anywhere without uh, query strings, and the WRQ module allows you to access the query strings as well. Uh, it's pretty straightforward, but it's not necessarily part of dispatching. If you look at the HTTP spec and you read through it, it becomes evident pretty quickly that query strings aren't meant for dispatching. So you can't necessarily access that. Um, I mean, there's enough flexibility in Web Machine to be able to do that, uh, but if you want, but the implement, simplest uh, implementation of the URL dispatching list is pretty straightforward. It is just pure Erlang, so you can change it, but um, uh, you can generally want to not use uh, your query strings in a dispatch. And so uh, by default, it's actually not very easy to do that uh, in web machines. So again, getting back to just making well-behaved HTTP applications, um, it just gives the intro user the ability to make an application that Maybe if this were a rookie mistake for, say, I don't know, a PHP dev like myself, um, I'm back in the day, not anymore, thank God, I'm recovering. Um, and uh, then you can um, uh, just simply um, build this URL dispatching, take advantage of it, and not make rookie mistakes like dispatching by some query, brain, uh, uh, query string. 
So that pretty much covers everything that you need to build an application. Yeah. See if I find the path to say full. Can you pass full as a, one of the the resource? Yeah, you can. Uh, so that's exactly, in fact, what you're doing right here. If you take a look at path info, um, that it's it's a little bit grayed out at the moment. There you go. Uh, if you look at WRQ path info, uh, foo, uh, basically. Um, you can see if I make this request at ABCD, uh, D, uh, I can access D by um, doing a path info uh, for foo, because I know that foo is the, uh, the actual atom that I'm, I'm aware of, and then it gives me the B, the B value. Uh, for some resources, presumably that's a function of code. Is that right? Nope, nope, just the WRQ path info and passing in the request data. Hopefully I answered that. Um, so, uh, more or less, uh, with the URL uh, pattern matching, you have everything that you need to build an application except for tooling. And, um, at, you know, obviously, uh, it's really nice to be able to do a little bit more than just build an application. It's also nice to be able to debug it very easily. And a lot of these images that I've been showing you as we've been going through, aren't just images that are ones that I picked out for demonstration. Um, actually, uh, if you use Web Machine, one of the really interesting features about it is that it has a visual debugger. Um, and as part of that visual debugger, uh, what you can do um, is actually see and trace all of your requests um, on each request and see the, path, the decision tree that it actually took to get, say, to a 200 where everything is nice and happy. Um, but if, of course, something breaks, we want to be able to see what's going on. So we can see a trace of how we got to this decision, and that's good. But if we say something bad happens and we return to 500, if you actually look at this map of the HTTP specification, you'll never find a 500. And the reason being is that a 500 is not a desirable result. There's no endpoint or no way to get to that endpoint. It's not term. It's not a terminal endpoint on this map. It's we didn't know what to do. So in order for us to display that, um, when we get a 500, an exception happens in Erlang. Um, basically, we can go and, and begin to inspect and see exactly how we got there. And when we go and build, uh, when we go and see, at the very end, we've marked a little red circle. Hey, right, this is where you got the 500. This is your. This is where it all breaks. And what's really nice in this visual debugger, for those of you who haven't seen it, you can actually take your mouse and hover over the image as it's displayed in your browser. And on the right hand side, uh, it will actually, for each decision point in each place, it will show you what the state was of the request data and what the state was, and if it, there was any exceptions or errors that were coming back. So I might actually have, for example, this, you know, I get to resource exists, and I can hover over that, I can inspect the two different states before and after and see what happened, but uh, in this case, I have the, uh, uh, I'm making this uh, request uh, to um, test, uh, you know, d slash test with a, a q equals 1.5, <laughs> and then if I just go ahead back and read some of the logs, I can see, or uh, read through the state in the debugger, I can see, Okay, well, I called Erlang list to integer, and I'm trying to cast more or less, you know, a list item or a, a, a list from, you know, a uh, from a list to a to an integer. But it, you know, we all know that's a float, so it throws an exception, and that's why we get this 500. So now I know exactly what I need to do to be able to fix this, which is good. Um, and the question is, how do you actually fix this? So uh, Actually, it's just going back to implementing the HTTP spec. We don't want to return a 500. We want to return a 400 because that's a malformed request. So I can just define the callback, the function, the resource function callback for a malformed request. I, you know, this is probably not the, the cleanest way of actually doing this, but hey, it fit on the slide, so I'm happy with it, right? So. Um, uh, I can go there and check, and if this is the case where I'm getting something that I can't uh, flip to it and uh, to an integer, I want to be able to uh, return the state that um, 
you know, it's a, well, I will return it true because basically it's a, um, uh, it's a malformed request. If I return the true, then we can actually take a look at it and we can see that we're actually following it to the, to the, to the right place on the map. And so now, again, I have a really well-behaved um, HTTP server um, that's following the rules of HTTP. Now, one other point that I'll make out uh, or point out is that we can also return a body here and be really, really nice to the end user and let them know exactly what happened, but we don't have to. So you have that flexibility um, with web machine. And that's you know, ultimately the point of what I'm trying to get across is that uh, web machine is just a really nice, friendly way to be able to write a uh, friendly and easily, easy way to write well-behaved HTTP applications. Um, but it's also important for you guys to know what, a, uh, H, uh, what web machine is not. And as I pointed out earlier, it's not a full-fledged framework. It doesn't do ORM or storage or templating or anything like that. It is definitely not Django or Rails. Um, and at the same time, it's uh, not necessarily a low-level network server either. So it doesn't just let you go off and do whatever you want to do by opening up a, you know, a, uh, a socket on port 80 and start doing AMP or something like that. It is absolutely built for the web. It is made to, and shaped for HTTP to follow the uh, specification. So it's, it's somewhere in between a framework and just a raw you know, network, general purpose network uh, uh, server. Um, so uh, that's exactly the point I wanted to get at. And um, it's also, for those of you who are new to Erlang web, web developers, maybe you're coming from some other languages, uh, it, we've actually had this ported by the community um, into various other ones. There's Python, Clojure, uh, Ruby. I think there's some Node.js app out there as well. So if you're coming from any one of those, it's also a chance for you to go and explore there before you just go and jump right into Erlang as well. Um, and uh, you know, the last thing that I'll actually mention about um, Web Machine is it's been in a lot of production systems. And for those of you who use React, anybody here? Okay. I'm guessing it was used to generate the first console. Uh, it's definitely you, it's still used it's Web still Machine. It, Web Machine is the HTTP front end. Um, of, of it, and uh, actually, um, so if you're accessing React through HTTP, you're using Web Machine right now. So um, the other thing that I thought was worth pointing out is, let's see if I can get my, this is a shameless plug. Um, so, uh, Four years ago, I started writing Erlang, and um, uh, I, I did it with Web Machine, and, and I loved it so much that I was like, man, I'm going to join Basho, but I didn't give up on my little side projects, so I actually, uh, you know, this is actually an up and running service now, and it's built completely on Web Machine and Reoc, and I've used a lot more of the, uh, the Basho stuff as well, so um, and my friends and I have built um, an application using uh, Web Machine, Reoc, and React Core, and so uh, definitely a lot of really good open source things coming out of Basho. Um, if you're not following us on GitHub, uh, you should. And um, you know, it was a pleasure to talk to you guys. If you have any questions, I'm happy to take them. WebSockets. WebSockets not supported yet. Although I think um, anybody here from Cowboy? Right there. So did you? I know that you started working on. Uh, porting Web Machine from Moshi Web to, or, or at least to be able to use Web Machine resources, right? Yeah. And do you guys have support for WebSockets as well? Yeah, okay. Actually, that, that's a good question because even in, in this app, that's actually something I would like to implement. We've been looking at Cowboy, the, the Cowboy stuff as well. Um, but uh, we just do a bunch of long pulling. Yep. I have a question about the app is called the negotiation. I'm sorry? Does the machine offer any app uh, regarding the type negotiation? 
Uh, no, it leaves it completely to you. I mean, it generally makes some choices uh, by default, um, but uh, you can see uh, if we took a look at my presentation again. Let's see if I can pull this back up. Um, the question was, uh, does web does web machine offer any help around content type negotiation? Let me see if I can get there fast enough. So you can see here this callback for two, uh, two HTML. It would actually give you back. Um, I believe it would give you the. It would give you back the the correct content type. Uh, it, there's also I think a callback for two JSON, um, or you might have to define it yourself. I can't remember exactly off the top of my head. Um, I know that in my code I have a two JSON. Uh, and it's, I believe, sets the content type to application JSON. So you can do <coughs> and stuff like that as well. So, but I think it does leave it to you more or less. But there might be some built-ins just for like making life easy since they're so common. Um, and I, I think they might be. I kind of feel like they're there. So, all right, guys. Thank you very much. I see them. Coming.